The seventh law of achievement is the law of preparation, which states that perfect performance is preceded by painstaking preparation. The mark of a serious person and a true professional in any field is that they take more time to prepare thoroughly than the average person does. The non-serious person or non-professional always attempts to bluff or wing it, trying to get by with a minimum of preparation without realizing that their level of preparation is immediately evident to everyone around them. One of my favorite quotes, which has had a powerful effect on shaping my life and attitude, comes from Abraham Lincoln, who said, I shall study and prepare myself, and someday my chance will come. He recognized, as do all great men and women, that painstaking and thorough preparation is the key to the future. The first part of the law of preparation is simply, do your homework. It's the details that trick you up every single time. My friend Joel Weldon gave a wonderful talk entitled Elephants Don't Bite, emphasizing that it's the mosquitoes of life, the small things that tend to be ignored, that cause you the most trouble. No one ever gets bitten by an elephant, but people get bitten by mosquitoes all the time. His message was that if you want to get to the top of your field, you must be fastidious about the little things because, as a minister once said, God is in the details. The second part of the law of preparation comes from the business writer Peter Drucker, who wrote that action without thinking is the cause of every failure. Action without taking the time to think through the details and their possible ramifications seems to be the underlying cause of most failures in life. Conversely, action preceded by thinking and planning is the cause of virtually every success. This doesn't mean that you'll automatically be successful if you plan thoroughly in advance, but it means that you must almost inevitably fail if you don't do it. The third part of this law comes from Benjamin Trigo, who said, if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. Details are important, but you need to think through the value and importance of each detail before you overcommit your time and resources to them. The eighth law of achievement is the law of forced efficiency. This law states that the more things you have to do in a limited space of time, the more you will be forced to work on your most important tasks. This is another way of saying that there's never enough time to do everything, but there's always enough time to do the important things. The more you take on, the more likely it is that you'll be forced to think. Analyze and evaluate your tasks and activities in such a way that you spend your limited mental and physical energy on just those tasks that are most vital to your success. There are two parts to the law of forced efficiency. First, there will never be enough time to do everything that you have to do. The busier and more successful you become, the truer this statement will be. If you have lots of time to do your work, it means that you are underemployed, underpaid, and well along the low road to frustration and disappointment in your career. The fact is that you can only discover how much you can do by trying to do too much. You can only find out how far you can go by going too far. You discover how much you can take on by taking on more than you can do. The second part of this law, which is the key question in personal efficiency and time management, is to ask yourself continually, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? Always keep yourself on track and focus on your most important responsibilities by asking yourself, hour by hour and minute by minute, what is the most valuable use of my time right now? The ninth law of achievement is the law of decision. It says that every great leap forward in life is preceded by a clear decision that leads to action. While all high achieving men and women tend to be very decisive in their thoughts and actions, they think things through carefully, decide exactly what they want, and then make clear decisions and take action to make those decisions a reality. In your life, you've had several experiences where you've been unsure of what to do, and you've resolved your dilemma by making a clear decision one way or the other. In looking back, you'll probably find that that was the turning point for you, and that everything else flowed from the decision. The ability to make good decisions is one of the most critical thinking skills of the successful man or woman. In fact, in one study, the careers of managers who were promoted rapidly were compared to those of managers who were passed over for promotion. Researchers found that the one distinguishing behavior between the two groups was that the more rapidly promoted, managers were more decisive in doing their jobs. The interesting fact that came out of this study was that, given written tests with hypothetical problems, both sets of managers were equally accurate in their answers. The more successful managers, however, on the job, were willing to make decisions based on their answers, while the unsuccessful managers were afraid to, for fear of making a mistake, 
The very act of being decisive can be the critical factor that enables you to take command of a situation and move ahead more rapidly. We found that high achievers are not necessarily those who make the right decisions every time, but they are those people who make their decisions right. They accept feedback and self-correct. They take in new information and they change if necessary. But they are always decisive. Always moving forward. Never wishy-washy or vacillating in their attitudes toward life. The first part of the law of decision is simply this. Act boldly, and unseen forces will come to your aid. It seems that when you grasp a situation and step forward courageously, a series of unseen forces, most of which are explained by the laws in this program, seem to emerge and help you to achieve your goals. Your very willingness to take action, rather than to delay or procrastinate, seems to bring universal powers to your assistance. The second part of the Law of Decision comes from the wonderful book by Dorothea Branda, entitled Wake Up and Live. She wrote that the discovery that changed her life and the lives of thousands of others who heard it from her in her public talks was the simple success formula that says, act as if it were impossible to fail, and it shall be. When you imagine that your success will be guaranteed if you simply take action and you act on that premise, a whole series of forces begins to support you and move you toward the attainment of your desires. So when in doubt, act as if it were impossible to fail, and push forward. The third part of the law of decision comes from the famous Nike commercial, which says, just do it. These three words really summarize one of the great formulas for success. Just do it. So be decisive, go for it, take a chance, act boldly, and unseen forces will come to your aid. The tenth law of achievement is the law of creativity. It says that every advance in human life begins with an idea in the mind of one person. It's ideas that you generate that enable you to solve your problems, overcome your obstacles, and achieve your goals. Ideas are the keys to the future. It's hardly possible for you to achieve anything of note, except to the degree to which you think and do something new and different from what's been done before. All it takes is a small innovation to lay the foundation for a fortune and great success in life. The first part of this law says that your ability to generate constructive ideas is, to all intents and purposes, unlimited. Therefore, your future potential is unlimited as well. Ideas are a mode of transportation, a vehicle that you can use to take you from wherever you are to wherever you want to go. Your job is simply to generate as many ideas as possible, to evaluate them carefully against your current goals, and then to take action on them. There's virtually no obstacle in life that you cannot overcome with the power of thought, with the power of creative concentration, with the power of ideas. The second part of this law comes from Napoleon Hill, who said in his famous words, Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Your mind is structured in such a way that you cannot, at the same time, have an idea and not also have the ability to bring that idea into reality. The very existence of an idea in your conscious mind means that you have within you and around you the capacity to achieve it. The only question you have to ask yourself is, how badly do I want it? The third part of the law of creativity comes from Napoleon Bonaparte who said, imagination rules the world. Everything you see around you is the result of what was initially a single idea in the mind of a single person. Our entire world started from thought, brought into reality. The fourth and final part of this law comes from Einstein, who said simply that, imagination is more important than facts. There have been countless occasions in your life, in the lives of others, where the facts say one thing, but your ideas and creative energy enable you to do something completely different. Virtually every important turning point in your life will be marked by an idea that you've had at that time and moment. All great changes in human life and human destiny begin with an idea that causes you to see things differently and to take Action that you would not have taken in the absence of that idea. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your situation, you have the creative capacity in the form of an infinite ability to generate ideas to solve any problem and achieve any goal. It's up to you. The eleventh law of achievement is the law of flexibility. This law says that success is best achieved when you are clear about the goal, but flexible about the process of getting there. This is one of the most important conclusions ever reached by high-achieving men and women. When you set a clear goal for yourself and make a plan, you usually have a fairly good idea of what it is you have to do to get whatever it is you want to achieve. However, a thousand things can change, 
each of which will require alterations in your plan of action. The most optimistic and enthusiastic people are those who are open, flexible and fluid in the face of the inevitable, and the myriad changes required as they move toward the accomplishment of something that's important to them. The first part of the law of flexibility is that the experience of resistance and frustration is often an indication that you're doing the wrong thing. Whenever you feel that you're butting your head against the wall and not making progress, step back and re-examine your plan. Be sure that the goal you're working toward is still the goal that you desire, and then sit down and make better plans. Take the mentality of a computer programmer. When he designs a computer program, he knows that the program will be full of defects when it's completed. No computer program ever works perfectly the first time it's tried. However, the programmer accepts this as a factor of life, and then begins to go back through the program step by step to remove the defects. When the programmer is finished, the program will operate perfectly. By the same token, whenever your plans don't seem to be bearing fruit, look in the mirror, re-examine your plans, and redesign them until you have faultless plans that work and move you forward without anxiety and frustration. The second part of the law of flexibility is that you are only as free in life as the number of developed options that you have available to you. Your freedom and happiness are largely determined by the number of alternatives that you've developed in case your first choice doesn't work. The more thoroughly developed your options and alternatives, the more freedom you have if one course of action doesn't develop as you expected. You're fully prepared to switch. In my courses on decision making, once the decision has been reached, I encourage the participants to ask the question, what else would be a good decision in this situation? The very exercise of developing alternatives enables you to think more clearly and can be a major contributor to the level of achievement that you experience. The third part of the law of flexibility is that crisis is change trying to take place. Whenever you're experiencing a crisis or difficulty of any kind, step back for a moment and ask yourself, what change is trying to take place that is being signaled to me as a result of this crisis? You may be having a crisis in your work, in your personal relationships, with your health, or with your business. In almost every case, the crisis is an indication that something is wrong and that pursuing the same course would be unwise. So, what is the change that's trying to take place in your life right now? The fourth part of the law of flexibility is that errant assumptions lie at the root of every failure. Almost every failure you have will be based on an incorrect assumption that you've made and accepted without question. It's always a good exercise to clarify your assumptions, especially when things aren't going as well as you want. So, first, what are your explicit assumptions? These are the ones you're clearly aware of. Second, what are your implicit assumptions? These are the ones you may be accepting without question. What if your most cherished assumptions were wrong? What changes would this dictate? How flexible and fluid would you have to be to redirect your course of action if something you assume as fact turned out not to be true at all? Whenever you make the right decisions and achieve your goals on schedule, it's because the assumptions you were operating on turned out to be true. Many people go broke starting their own businesses because they assume there's a big enough market for their product or service. They also assume customers will switch from their current suppliers to them for no other reason than being in the marketplace. Sometimes they assume they have the talents and skills to provide the product or service at a competitive price and still make a profit. Your willingness to question your assumptions, to test them against reality, with the willingness to accept the possibility that you could be wrong, is the kind of attitude that will ultimately lead you to great achievement. Flexibility is perhaps the most important quality necessary for success in our competitive society for the rest of the century and beyond. The twelfth law of achievement is the law of persistence. This law says that your ability to persist in the face of setbacks and disappointments is your measure of your belief in yourself and your ability to succeed. Persistence is the iron quality of success. Sometimes, your willingness to persist is your greatest asset and is the quality that separates you from everyone else. Sometimes, the strongest thing you have going for you is your ability to persist longer than anyone else. The first part of the law of persistence is simply that persistence is self-discipline in action. It's when you face the inevitable setbacks, delays, disappointments, and temporary defeats, and you continue to persist in spite of them, that you demonstrate to yourself and others that you have the character of self-discipline and self-mastery that is absolutely indispensable for the great success that you desire. Churchill summarized the second part of the law of persistence when he said, Never give up, never, never give up. Churchill believed, and he proved throughout his lifetime, 
that bulldog tenacity in the face of what appeared to be overwhelming defeat was often the critical quality that turned that defeat into victory. Earlier, I mentioned that intense burning desire is essential to overcoming obstacles and achieving great goals. For your desire to be intense enough, your goals must be purely personal. They must be goals that you choose for yourself, rather than goals that someone else wants for you, or that you want to achieve to please someone in your life. In goal setting, for the process to be effective, you must be perfectly selfish about what you really, really want for yourself. This doesn't mean that you cannot do things for other people, either at home or at work. This simply means that in setting goals for your life, you start with yourself and work forward. The great question, one of the most important questions in goal setting is this. What do I really want to do with my life? If you could do, be, or have anything at all in life, what would it be? Remember, you can't hit a target you can't see. You should return to this question over and over again in the months and years ahead. What do I really want to do with my life? In determining your true goals, you start with your vision, your values, and your ideals. When you begin, these will often feel a bit like fantasies detached from reality. However, now your job is to make them concrete, like designing a dream house on paper. You start with your general goals and then move to more specific goals. What are your three most important goals in your business and career right now? What are your three most important financial goals right now? What are your three most important family or relationship goals right now? What are your three most important health and fitness goals right now? The flip side of the above questions is for you to ask, what are my three biggest worries or concerns in life right now? What bothers you, worries you, concerns you, and preoccupies you in your day-to-day -day life? What aggravates or irritates you? What is robbing you of happiness more than anything else? As a friend of mine often asks, where does it hurt? Once you have identified your biggest problems, worries, or concerns, ask yourself, what are the ideal solutions to each of these problems? How could I eliminate these problems or worries immediately? What is the fastest and most direct way to solve this problem? In 1142, William of Ockham, a British philosopher, proposed a method of problem solving that has come to be referred to as Ockham's Razor. This way of thinking has become famous and popular throughout the ages. What Occam said was that the simplest and most direct solution requiring the fewest number of steps is usually the correct solution to any problem. Many people make the mistake of overcomplicating goals and problems, but the more complicated the solution, the less likely it is ever to be implemented, and the longer the time it will take to get any results. Your aim should be to simplify the solution and go directly to the goal as quickly as possible. For example, many people tell me that they would like to double their incomes. If they are in sales, I ask them, what is the fastest and most direct way to double your income? After they have come up with a series of suggestions, I give them what I consider to be the best answer. Double the amount of time that you spend face to face with qualified prospects. The most direct way to increase your sales has always been the same. Spend more time with better prospects. If you don't upgrade your skills or change anything else about what you are doing, but you double the number of minutes that you spend face to face with prospects each day, you will probably double your sales income. According to studies that go back as far as 1928, the average salesperson today spends 90 minutes each day face to face with prospects. The highest paid salespeople spend two or three times that amount. They organize their days efficiently to assure that they spend more minutes in the presence of people who can and will buy their products or services. And the more time they spend with prospects and customers, the more skilled they become at selling, the better they get, the more they sell, and the more they earn, and in less time. If you examine your work, you will find that 20% of what you do accounts for 80% of the value of all the things you do. In my advanced coaching programs, we teach our clients to identify those 20% of activities that contribute the very most value, and then do twice as many of them. Instead of using their intelligence to juggle their time and accomplish a greater number of tasks, we teach them to do fewer tasks but tasks of higher value. Some of our clients double their productivity and subsequently their income in as little as 30 days with this approach, even if they have been working for many years in the same position. Always look for the simplest and most direct way to get from where you are to where you want to go. Look for the solution that has the fewest number of steps. And most of all, take action. Get going. Get busy. Develop a sense of urgency. The best ideas in the world are of no value until they are implemented. As the poet said, 
The saddest words of mice and men are these. It might have been. In determining your true goals, use the magic wand technique. Imagine that you have a magic wand that you can wave over a particular area of your life. When you wave this magic wand, your wishes come true. Wave a magic wand over your business and career. If you could have any three wishes in your work, what would they be? Wave a magic wand over your financial life. If you could have any three wishes in your financial life, what would they be? Wave a magic wand over your family life and your relationships. If you could have any three wishes in this area, what would they be? If your family life were ideal in every respect, what would it look like? Wave a magic wand over your health and fitness. If you could have any three wishes with regard to your body and your physical well-being, what would they be? If your health were perfect, how would it be different from today? Wave a magic wand over your skills and abilities. If you could have any three skills or abilities developed to a high level, what would they be? In what areas would you like to excel? The magic wand technique is fun on the one hand but quite revealing on the other. Whenever you imagine that you have a magic wand, your true goals in that area emerge. You can also use this exercise for other people who are not sure about what they want or where they are going. It is amazing what comes out when you ask this question. Here is another goal-setting question that reflects your true values. Imagine that you went to a doctor for a full medical checkup. Your doctor calls you back a few days later and says, I have good news for you and I have bad news for you. The good news is that for the next six months, you are going to live the healthiest and most energetic life you could possibly imagine. The bad news is that at the end of 180 days, because of an incurable illness, you will drop stone dead. If you learned today that you only had six months left to live, how would you spend your last six months on earth? Who would you spend the time with? Where would you go? What would you strive to complete? What would you do more of or less of? When you ask yourself this question, what comes to the top of your mind will be a reflection of your true values. Your answer would almost always include the most important people in your life. Very few people in this situation would say, well, I'd like to get back to the office and return a few phone calls. In setting your true goals, this exercise is an extension of imagining that you have no limitations. Make up a dream list. A dream list is a list of everything you would like to be, have or do in your life sometime in the future if you had no limitations at all. Mark Victor Hansen, co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, recommends that you sit down with a pad of paper and make a list of at least 100 goals that you want to accomplish in your lifetime. Then imagine that you have all the time, all the money, all the friends, all the abilities, and all the resources necessary to achieve these goals. Let yourself dream and fantasize. Just write down everything that you would like to have as if you had no limitations at all. The amazing discovery you will make is that within 30 days after writing out this list of 100 dreams, remarkable things will begin to happen in your life, and your goals will start to be achieved at a rate that you cannot even imagine today. This seems to happen to virtually everyone who has written down at least 100 goals. You should give it a try. You could be amazed at the results. Here is another goal-setting question. If you were to receive a million dollars tomorrow, cash, tax-free, how would you change your life? What would you do differently? What would you get into or out of? What would you do more of or less of? What would be the first thing you would do if you learned today that you had just received one million dollars cash? This is a way of asking the question, how would you change your life if you were completely free to choose? The primary reason that we stay in situations that are not the best for us is because we fear change. But when you imagine that you have all the money that you will ever need to do or be whatever you want, your true goals often emerge. For example, if you were currently in the wrong job for you, the idea of winning a large amount of money would cause you to think about quitting that job immediately. If you were in the right job for you, however, winning a lot of money would not affect your career choice at all. So ask yourself, what would I do if I won a million dollars cash, tax-free tomorrow? Here's another question to help you clarify your true goals. What have you always wanted to do, but been afraid to attempt? When you look around your world, and you look at other people who are doing things that you admire, what have you always wanted to do as well, but have been afraid of taking the chance? Have you wanted to start your own business? Have you wanted to run for public office? Have you wanted to embark on a new career? What have you always wanted to do but been afraid to attempt? In setting goals for your life, short and long term, you should continually ask yourself, what do I most enjoy doing in each area of my life? For instance, 
If you could do just one thing all day long in your work, what would it be? If you could do any job or full-time activity all the time without pay, what would it be? What sort of work or activity gives you the greatest joy and satisfaction? The psychologist Abraham Maslow identified what he called peak experiences. Those moments are times when the individual feels the happiest, most elated, and exhilarated. One of your aims in life is to enjoy as many peak experiences as possible. You achieve this by thinking back and identifying those moments of peak experience in your past, and by imagining how you could repeat them in your present and future. What have been your happiest moments in life up to now? How could you have more of those moments in the future? What do you really love to do? You should have goals for social and community involvement and contribution as well. Think about what kind of difference you would like to make in your world. What organizations, causes, needs or social problems would you like to work on or in? What changes would you like to see? Who is there who is less fortunate than you that you would like to help? If you were independently wealthy, what causes would you support most of all? What could you do today to begin making a difference in your world? Don't wait until some future date when everything will be ideal. Instead, start today in some way. One of the most important areas of goal setting is your financial life. If you can earn and accumulate all the money you need, you could probably achieve most of your non-financial goals faster and easier than you can today. If your life were ideal, how much? Money would you like to earn each month, each year? How much would you like to save and invest each month and year? How much would you like to be worth sometime in the future? What sort of estate would you like to accumulate by the time you retire, and when would you like that to be? Most people are hopelessly confused about their financial goals. But when you become absolutely clear about them for yourself, your ability to achieve them increases dramatically. When you are absolutely clear about what you want, you can then think about your goals most of the time. And the more you think about them, the faster they will materialize in your life. This process of asking yourself questions about your goals in each part of your life begins to clarify your thinking and make you a more focused and definite person. As Zig Ziglar says, you move from being a wandering generality to becoming a meaningful specific. Most of all, you reach the point where you can determine your major definite purpose in life. This is the springboard for great achievement and extraordinary accomplishment. Your major definite purpose will be the topic of the next chapter, and how to achieve it will be the subject of the chapters to come. Determine your true goals. Write down your three most important goals in life right now. What are your three most pressing problems or worries right now? If you want a million dollars cash tax-free tomorrow, what changes in your life would you make immediately? What do you really love to do? What gives you the greatest feelings of value, importance, and satisfaction? If you could wave a magic wand over your life and have anything you wanted, what would you wish for? How would you spend your time if you only had six months left to live? What would you really want to do with your life, especially if you had no limitations? How many times do you think that people try to achieve their new goals before they give up? The average is less than one time. Most people give up before they even make the first try. And the reason they give up is because of all the obstacles. Difficulties, problems, and roadblocks that immediately appear as soon as you decide to do something you've never done before. The fact is that successful people fail far more often than unsuccessful people. Successful people try more things, fall down, pick themselves up, and try again over and over again before they win through. Unsuccessful people try a few things, and if they try at all, very soon quit and go back to what they were doing before. You should expect to fail and fall short many times before you achieve your goals. You should look upon failure and temporary defeat as a part of the price you pay on your road to success. As Henry Ford once said, failure is merely an opportunity to more intelligently begin again. Once you have decided upon your goal, ask yourself, why am I not there already? What is holding me back? Why haven't I achieved that goal up to now? Identify all the obstacles that stand between you and your goal. Write down every single thing that you can think of that might be blocking you or slowing you down from moving ahead. Remember, you become what you think about most of the time. In the area of problems and difficulties, successful people have a particular way of thinking that we call solution orientation. Successful people think about solutions most of the time, while unsuccessful people think about problems and difficulties most of the time. 
Solution-oriented people are constantly looking for ways to get over, around, and past the obstacles that stand in their ways. Problem-oriented people talk continuously about their problems, about who or what caused them, how unhappy or angry they are, and how unfortunate it is that they have occurred. Between you and anything you want to accomplish, there will always be problems or obstacles of some kind. This is why success is sometimes defined as the ability to solve problems. Personal leadership is the ability to solve problems. Effectiveness is the ability to solve problems. While men and women who accomplish anything of importance are people who have developed the ability to solve the problems that stand between them and their goals. Fortunately, problem solving is a skill like riding a bicycle or typing with a typewriter which you can learn. And the more you focus on solutions, the more and better solutions will come to you. The better you get at solving problems, the faster you will be at solving each subsequent problem. And as you get better and faster at solving problems, you will attract even bigger and more expensive problems to solve. Eventually, you will be solving problems that can have significant financial consequences for you and others. This is the way the world works. The fact is that you have the ability to solve any problem or to overcome any obstacle on the path to your goal, if you desire the goal intensely enough. You have within you right now all the intelligence and ability you will ever need to overcome any obstacle that could possibly hold you back. One of the most important breakthroughs in thinking in the last few decades was described by Eliyahu Goldratt in his book The Goal, as the theory of constraints. This theory says that between you and anything you want to accomplish, there is a constraint or limiting factor that determines how fast you get to where you want to go. For example, if you are driving down the freeway, and there is traffic construction that is narrowing all the cars into a single lane, this bottleneck or choke point becomes the constraint that determines how fast you get to your destination. The speed at which you pass through this bottleneck will largely determine the speed of your entire journey. In accomplishing any major goal, there is always a constraint or bottleneck you must get through as well. Your job is to identify it accurately, and then to focus all of your energies on alleviating that key constraint. Your ability to remove this bottleneck or deal with this limiting factor can help you move ahead faster than perhaps any other step you can take. The 80-20 rule applies to the constraints between you and your goals. This rule says that 80% of your constraints will be within yourself. Only 20% of your constraints will be outside of yourself, contained in other people and situations. To put it another way, it is you personally who is usually the major roadblock that is setting the speed at which you achieve any goal that you set for yourself. For most people, this is hard to accept. But superior people are more concerned with what is right, rather than who is right. Superior people are more concerned with the truth of the situation, and what they can do to solve the problem, than they are with protecting their egos. Ask yourself, what is it in me that is holding me back? Look deep within yourself and identify the key constraints in your personality, temperament, skills, abilities, habits, education, or experience that might be holding you back from achieving the goals that you have set for yourself. Ask the brutal questions. Be completely honest with yourself. The primary obstacles between you and your goals are usually mental. They are psychological and emotional in character. They are within yourself rather than within the situation around you. And it is with these mental obstacles that you must begin if you want to achieve everything that is possible for you. The two major obstacles to success and achievement are fear and doubt. It is first of all the fears of failure, poverty, loss, embarrassment, or rejection that hold the average person back from trying in the first place. This is why the average number of times that a person tries with a new goal is less than one. As soon as they think of the goal, these fears overwhelm them, and like a bucket of water on a small fire, extinguish their desire completely. The second mental obstacle closely aligned to fear is that of self-doubt. We doubt our own abilities. We compare ourselves unfavorably to others and think that others are somehow better, smarter, and more competent than we are. We think, I'm not good enough. We feel inadequate and inferior to the challenges of achieving the great goals that we so much want to accomplish. Fortunately, if there is anything good about doubt and fear, it is that they are both learned emotions. Children come into the world with no doubts or fears at all, and whatever has been learned can be unlearned through practice and repetition. The primary antidotes to doubt and fear are courage and confidence. The higher your level of courage and confidence, the lower will be your levels of fear and doubt, and the less effect these negative emotions will have on your performance and behavior. The way that you develop courage and confidence is with knowledge and skill. 
most fear and doubt arise out of ignorance and feelings of inadequacy of some kind. The more you learn the things you need to know to achieve your goals, the less fear you will feel on the one hand, and the more courage and confidence you will feel on the other. Think about learning to drive for the first time. You were probably extremely tense and nervous and made a lot of mistakes. You may have driven erratically and been a danger to yourself and others. But over time, as you mastered the knowledge and skills of driving, you became better and better, and your confidence increased. Today you can quite comfortably get into your car and drive across the country with no fear or worry at all. You are so confident at driving that you can do it well without even thinking about it. The same principles apply to any skills you need to learn to achieve any goal you can set for yourself. Dr. Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania spent more than 25 years studying the phenomenon of what he called learned helplessness. Seligman concluded that more than 80% of the population suffers from learned helplessness to some degree, and occasionally to a very high degree indeed. A person suffering from learned helplessness feels that he or she is incapable of achieving his or her goals or improving his or her life. The most common manifestation of learned helplessness is contained in the words, I can't. Whenever the victim of learned helplessness is offered an opportunity, possibility, or new goal, he immediately responds by saying, I can't. He then goes on to give all the reasons why a particular goal or objective is not possible for him. The way you get over this natural tendency to sell yourself short is by setting small goals, making plans, and working on them each day. In this way, you gradually develop greater courage and confidence, like building up a muscle. As you become more confident in yourself and your abilities, you can set even larger goals. Over time, your doubts and fears will weaken, and your courage and confidence will grow and become the dominant force in your thinking. Eventually, with a record of successes behind you, it won't be long before you become unstoppable. The second mental obstacle that you need to overcome is the comfort zone. Many people become complacent with their current situations. They become so comfortable in a particular job, relationship, salary, or level of responsibility that they become reluctant to make any changes at all, even for the better. The comfort zone is a major obstacle to ambition, desire, determination, and accomplishment. People who get stuck in a comfort zone, combined with learned helplessness, are almost impossible to help in any way. Don't let this happen to you. The way that you get out of your comfort zone and break loose from learned helplessness is by setting big, challenging goals. You then break these goals down into specific tasks, set deadlines, and work on them every day. Like an ice floe breaking up in the spring, do the sluggishness and lethargy of learned helplessness and the comfort zone break up, and you begin moving faster and faster toward accomplishing more and more of what is possible for you. Once you have made a list of all the obstacles that are standing in the way of your achieving your major goals, organize the obstacles by priority. What is the largest single obstacle? If you could wave a magic wand and remove one major obstacle from your path, which one obstacle, if removed, would help you the most in moving ahead more rapidly? Management consultant Ian Mitroff has an interesting set of observations with regard to problem solving and the removal of obstacles. He says that whatever the problem, define it several different ways before you attempt to solve it. Beware of any problem for which there is only one definition or only one solution. When you ask the question with regard to your goal, why am I not there already? What answer comes to mind? What is holding you back? What is standing in your way? It is at this point that you have to drill down to determine the correct obstacle. Before you begin taking steps to remove it, you do this by asking the question, what else could be the problem? After each definition of the problem, you could start off by stating the problem in this way. I'm not earning enough money. What else is the problem? I'm not contributing enough value to be worth more money. What else could be the problem? I'm not good enough at what I do to be capable of getting results that are worth more than I'm earning today. Once you have determined the major obstacle that is holding you back, rewrite that obstacle as a positive goal. For example, you could now say, my goal is to continually upgrade my skills and abilities so that I am in the top 10% of money earners in my field. You then make a list of all the things that you could do to upgrade your knowledge and skills, improve your time management, increase your efficiency and effectiveness, and make more sales for your company. You set deadlines and measures next to each step in your strategy to achieve excellence in your field. You then select one key task and take action on it immediately. From then on, 
You hold your own feet to the fire. You become your own taskmaster. You discipline and drive yourself to do the things that you need to do to become the kind of person you need to become in order to achieve the goals that you have set for yourself. This exercise of identifying what is holding you back and then setting a clear written goal to remove that obstacle puts you back in control of your own life. By following through on your resolution, you virtually guarantee your ultimate success and the achievement of almost any goal you can set for yourself. If you have any questions or concerns about the accuracy of your problem definition, discuss it with someone you know and trust. Put your ego aside, invite honest feedback and criticism, and be open to the possibility that you have fundamental flaws and weaknesses that are standing in the way of your realizing your full potential. Be brutally honest with yourself. Once your problem or obstacle is clear to you, ideas, opportunities and answers will come to you from various sources. You will begin to attract into your life all kinds of resources that will help you to overcome the obstacle or difficulty, either within yourself or within the situation around you, and move you more rapidly toward your goal. Remember the old poem, For every problem under the sun, there is a solution, or there is none. If there is a solution, go and find it. If there isn't, never mind it. For every problem or obstacle that is standing between you and what you want to accomplish, there is a solution of some kind, somewhere. Your job is to be absolutely clear about what sets the speed at which you achieve your goal, and then to focus your time and attention on alleviating that constraint by removing your major obstacle. You will often make more progress in a few months than the average person might make in several years. Your ability to develop and use your inborn creativity will determine your success in life as much or more than any other single factor. Each time you focus your mind on solving a problem and come up with an idea or an insight, you actually experience a positive feeling of excitement, energy, and joy. Using your creativity systematically gives you a greater sense of control over your life, boosts your self-esteem, and moves you ahead toward achieving your goals. Creativity is vital to your success. We've all heard the statistic that the average person uses less than 10% of his or her mental capacity. Well, recent research at Stanford University suggests it is closer to 2%, surely not more than 5. It means that compared to what you could be, you are only enjoying a small part of your existing potential. Children tested between the ages of 2 and 4 test out at 95% highly creative. When the same children are tested later at age 7, only 4% of them are still highly creative. Between the ages of 4 and 7, children who are naturally curious, and by the way curiosity is a hallmark of creativity, are told over and over to stop asking so many questions. The innate curiosity and creativity are stifled, and the child begins to conform in order to be free of criticism and the feelings of guilt and inferiority caused by criticism. As adults most people resist change, fear new things, avoid asking questions, and stick rigidly to established ways. The two major obstacles to creative thinking are first, homeostasis, which means clinging to the status quo, or trying to continue acting and thinking in habitual ways. And the second is psychosclerosis, which is a hardening of the attitudes evidenced in rigidness of thinking, and the refusal to consider alternatives. You can tell how open and flexible your thinking is by seeing how easily you can make three statements or admissions. How easily can you say, I was wrong, I made a mistake especially to your children, to your spouse, and to your subordinates. How easily can you say, I changed my mind, I thought it over, and I've changed my mind. And how easily can you say, I don't know, or, I don't know, but I'll find out. And you can improve by practicing these three statements, say them over and over until they flow naturally out of you. However, Einstein said, every child is born a genius. You were born a genius. And the wonderful thing about your genius is that you still have it. Creativity is your natural birthright. It is as much a part of you as your heart and lungs. It doesn't die with lack of use. It simply goes into hibernation. And you can wake it up and activate it in your life whenever you decide to. Today, the very first step to performing like a genius is to accept the fact that deep inside you lies a vast storehouse of wisdom, intelligence, and creativity that you habitually fail to use. Remember, you cannot achieve more just by working longer, harder hours. You must also work smarter. Intelligence is not simply IQ. Intelligence is a way of acting when confronting problems. Many geniuses have ordinary IQs. They are geniuses because they use their minds better than others do. 
There are basically three qualities of genius. First, geniuses have an open, almost childlike mind. They are receptive to many different ways of exploring the problem. They engage in what is called divergent thinking, and they let their minds consider many approaches to a solution. The second quality of genius is the ability to concentrate intensely, single-mindedly, without diversion or distraction, on one thing at a time, bringing all their mental powers to bear on one issue, like a laser beam cutting through steel. The third quality of genius is the ability to approach every problem systematically, using an orderly process to reach sound, well-thought-out conclusions. Let me mention some very important points with regard to creative thinking. The more positive you are, the greater will be the quantity and quality of ideas you come up with. The more you laugh when you're working on a problem, the more likely it is for you to come up with unique ideas and insights. Conversely, tension, stress, anxiety, fear, actually shut down large parts of the brain to try to stay calm, positive and relaxed when solving a problem. Look for the good in each difficulty you face or look for something funny in the situation. Confidently expect to find something positive in any adversity or setback, even just a valuable lesson. This exercise really works and will help you to be more creative and more constructive in any situation. Now, here's a systematic method described by Earl Nightingale in his wonderful audio cassette program, Lead the Field. First, write out your most important problem or obstacle in the form of a question at the top of a blank sheet of paper. For example, your goal may be to earn $30,000 per year. The question would be, what can I do to earn $30,000 per year? Write out 20 answers to your question and stay at it until you have the full 20 answers. Often, answer number 20 will be worth more than all the other 19 answers put together. Then, select one of your answers or solutions and implement it immediately. You can implement as many as you have time for, but be sure to go to work on at least one. This simple exercise will give you clarity, focus, and energy. And more people have become wealthy using this 20 idea method, what I call mindstorming, than by any other single method of creative thinking. Unlocking your amazing mind to achieve goals or solve problems always begins with clarity and decisiveness. The more clear you are about what you want, the more rapidly your mind will go to work to bring it to you. Another simple mindstorming exercise you can use is to first write out a clear answer to the question, what am I trying to achieve, avoid, or preserve? Be as specific as possible. Then, quickly write down every detail of the problem. Often, the exact answer you're looking for will emerge as you write. When a problem or obstacle is more complex or not amenable to a quick solution, here is a powerful systematic method you can use, alone or in conjunction with others. It has nine simple steps. Step 1. Approach the problem as though there were a simple, logical solution just waiting to be uncovered. This attitude of confident expectation keeps the mind positive and enhances creativity. Step 2. Use positive language. The language that you choose affects the way that you think and how clearly you think about any issue. Instead of the word problem, which is a negative word, use the word situation, which is a neutral word, or better yet, use challenge, which is a positive word, or even better, opportunity. Step 3. Ask, what exactly is the situation? In writing, as they say in medicine, accurate diagnosis is 50% of the cure. Probably half of the problems or situations that you wrestle with in the course of the day can be defined if you'll simply define them accurately. Step 4. Ask, what are all the possible reasons or causes for this situation? This is an extremely important step because if you do not remove the causes, you may solve the particular situation, but you will leave the causes in place, and the situation will repeat itself. And wherever you see a situation that occurs over and over again, what it means is that the causative factors have not been dealt with, even though a temporary solution has been implemented. Step 5. Make a decision. Often, any decision is better than no decision. Develop the habit of decisiveness. As soon as you make a decision, you begin to get feedback, which enables you to correct the decision, and gives you more feedback, which enables you to continue to correct. And the very most successful people in every field are decisive. Step 6. Assign specific responsibility. Who exactly is going to carry out the decision? If it's you, accept the responsibility. If it's someone else, make it very clear to them what they're expected to do. Step 7. Set a deadline for completion. This is very important. 
If you have not set a timeline and made your decision time specific, all you've simply done is had an interesting discussion, but you have not solved the situation or the problem. And finally, step eight, take action as soon as possible. Get going, get busy, get to work on it. One of the things that we have found over and over again is that the surest way to deal with a major problem is to bring all your energies to bear on it as soon as you possibly can and stay with it non-stop until the problem is resolved. Finally, if you can't solve your problem using the methods we've discussed, here are some focused questions you can pose to stimulate creativity. Here's one of my favorites. What are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? Remember, if you're pursuing a particular course of action and you have nothing but problems along that course of action, it may indicate that the course of action or the plan is incorrect. What are your basic assumptions? Both your conscious and your unconscious assumptions. Could they be wrong? Incorrect assumptions lie at the root of every failure. Whenever you find yourself experiencing frustration in achieving a particular goal, almost invariably, you have made incorrect assumptions. You have to go back in the past, back into the history of the situation, and say, what assumptions have we made here? What if you did exactly the opposite of what you were doing right now? Consider doing exactly the opposite of your current course of action, and then think about doing the opposite of that. Very often you'll come up with some very creative ways to approach the situation. Be willing to draw a line under everything you're doing today. Imagine starting over with a clear slate, knowing what you now know differently. What would you change? What would you get into or get out of? Most of all, what are you going to do about it? When are you going to do it? Here are seven points to remember on creativity. As long as there are people's needs unmet and human problems unsolved, there are opportunities for you to innovate and move ahead. All you need to do is be 10% new in any field to start a fortune. Look for ways to improve what is being done by doing it faster, cheaper, better, easier. Improvements of any kind offer great opportunities. Look into yourself for the solutions to the dilemmas that you face every day. Read continually in your field, research, study, take courses, attend trade shows. Sure, it's time consuming and hard work. That's why failures never do it. To increase your income, look continually for new ways to give people what they want. Look at what your competition is doing successfully, learn from them, copy them if necessary, and then do it better. Cherish your mistakes and learn from your failures. They contain valuable lessons that you will need to be successful. Approach every problem or difficulty as though it were sent to make you smarter and stronger. Finally, learn to trust your intuition. Trust yourself. Remember that you are a genius to the degree to which you accept your genius and act upon it, applying your wonderful mind to the challenges of opportunity that confront it.